like that, let's turn in our Bibles to Proverbs 24, title of our study, Warnings to the Wise. Proverbs 24, Warnings to the Wise. We start verse 1, Proverbs 24, Do not be envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them. Before we press on at all, who's he talking to here? Not the evil man. He's not warning them, oh, he will later, and he will even a bit here. But the warning is to the wise, not to look at the evil person, not to look at the stuff they've gathered or the things they're doing and envy them. Do not be envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them, for their heart devises violence and their lips talk of troublemaking. Envy, it is a seriously ugly sin of the heart and of the mind. It's so common culturally that few today even seem to recognize its defiling impact. When I'm filled with envy or jealousy, well, that's impossible. If, if I were, no, I've been envious before. You've been envious before. And the, the, the reason he brings it up and the reason we're going to, you know, spend a moment on it is because it's not just common out there in the world of ignorance to God or apathy toward God or hostility toward God. God's people are a jealous people. God's people envy. And he's saying, that's got to stop. By the way, when it says do not, uh, it, it really is still speaking to us because the tense and sense and many of these do nots is actually stop doing that. You know, it, it's not like he thinks it's possible and he's saying don't let it happen. He's saying if you're doing it, you better stop it. So uh, envy, serious sin. It's not just defiling inwardly, it is destructive to all around us. And he says, of the wicked, their hearts devise violence. Their imagination, their meditation isn't on how they can bless the Lord or bless people. It's how they can take advantage of others, make their world what they imagine it could be. Their words are perverse, mischievous grievous. This, by the way, the second of three warnings in just these two chapters, the one that preceded Proverbs 23 and now in Proverbs 24. In Proverbs 23, he said, do not let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day, for surely there is a hereafter and your hope will not be cut off. It poses the question, why would we envy wicked people? The reason is pretty straightforward and simple because they're prospering. If you're the godly guy at work, you come in, you clock in early, you work overtime, you're not always trying to find out, will that be on the clock if the boss asks something extra of you? You're working hard, you're trying to be a good witness, and there's this guy who's a total flake, but he's a great schmoozer. You know that guy? He's always schmoozing the boss. And, and, and you're like, does the boss not see what this guy's up to? And then apparently the boss doesn't because when it comes time for the promotion, he gets it. When it comes time for the raise, he gets it. And you're like, how in the world does he get promoted when I do twice as much work as him? How does he get promoted when he, he doesn't even know what he's doing on this job? Well, here's how it happens. That, that's the world, right? It happens. We know it, it, we see it, and it affects us. And so it's natural, by the way, to just think, this is so wrong, and to begin to envy what he has, the position he's attained, especially if you don't believe he deserves it. But here's the thing. God's just telling us straight up, don't envy him. Why? First of all, look at it here. Surely, verse 18 Oh, Proverbs 13, I mentioned that, right? We're back one chapter just for a moment. For surely there is a hereafter, and your hope will not be cut off. You have a future and a hope, and it's not all about what you can attain to in this world or what you can amass to yourself. It's about what 
you're laying up in heaven because, well, you're going to be there for a while. And then when the Lord returns to the earth, you're going to be here with him. Wherever he is, whatever he's doing, we're going to be with him. So blessings await us in the Lord's presence that are unimaginable to us. I mean, he, he can't even begin to describe the glory that awaits us and unattainable to the wicked. Whatever they may get here or have here, it's only for a season. But eternity, well, we call it eternity. Really, it's just everlasting because eternity would look back and forward. Well, the other thing, Proverbs 24. So if you looked at 23, jump back into 24. And then in verse 19, and then we're going to just work our way through all of it. Proverbs 24, 19, third time he says it. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the wicked. For there is, will be no prospect for the evil man. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. Whatever the wicked fears in those rare moments of clarity, the pain, the despair of their everlasting reality, far worse they, than they can begin to imagine. You should know that's what God's rescued you from. The wages of sin is death, separation from God eternally. And the worst part of hell isn't that it's hot or that it's dark or that it's, it's that it's hopeless that people end up there because they reject God's offer of forgiveness and pardon because they mock the idea that God will judge them. And we'll see that later in this study. There is darkness, there is despair, there is hopelessness. None of that is our present reality, nor is that our future reality. And by our, I mean all who are in Christ Jesus. If you're here and you've never surrendered to the Lord Jesus, if you've never said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, Jesus, save me from my sin, you're still dead in trespasses and sin. And Jesus died that you might have life eternal and life abundant. Well, their reality far worse, mocking God's warning of coming judgment, rejecting his call to repentance. Why would we envy anyone who is on that path? Through wisdom, verse 3, a house is built. He turns the corner and we will with him. Back in verse 3, Proverbs 24, through wisdom a house is built and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Now this is true in so many arenas. It's true physically because most houses in Solomon's day, much simpler than ours, although he lived in a palace, so he might have had a few things we're lacking, like, you know, servants to cook all that food and all those things. But listen, even in his day where the average person lived in a very modest home, it still took planning and preparation. There, there needed to be vision. There needed to be an understanding. And today... If you want to build something, you have to draw up plans. You have to have a vision of what you're trying to build. And, and then you have to submit those plans for approval. And they tell you if that's going to stand or not. Is it safe or not? Will it work or not? Then you lay the foundation and there's framing and there's wiring and there's plumbing. And there's all this stuff. And here's the crazy part. Everything in that first part is essential to the building standing and working. But you don't see any of it when the building's finished. You move in the house and you're not looking at the wiring. That's hidden. You're not looking at the plumbing. Well, you hope you never have to see it. But the point is this. Physically, it's the stuff you don't see that is most important to how the house will function. And of course, there's going to be spiritual application of that reality. Well, we fill our rooms, by the way, with appliances and furniture and luxuries that even Solomon could not have possibly imagined. We f it says, uh, by knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Now, we know he's not talking about merely building a physical house, though it all applies to the physical house. If you try to build without any of those things, you're going to have some real problems. 
But when it comes to our children, mentally, children learn what they, they're taught. They learn first by example, and the ultimate proof of it is they can speak long before they can read, long before they can write, before they can sing the ABCs. They're already asking, hey, can I have another cookie? And, and it's, it, it's a fact that, that they're learning first by our example, and then, of course, we're told we're to teach them formally and informally. We're to make sure we're teaching them not just math and, and science and all those things, but we're teaching them about the one who made them and what he made them for and how important they are to us and to God who gave them to us. Well, they learn by our actions. We teach them how to interact. I mentioned marriage and how important of a relationship it is because that's the relationship that children watch to figure out how grown-ups act toward one another more than any other. And so um, our instruction, again, formal, informal. We teach them what to believe and why. We teach them to love and trust and obey the Lord. And the bottom line, when he says, the, by knowledge the rooms are filled, our minds are like rooms. And we're filling them with something every day. We are, we are taking in. And because of the age in which we're living, we are taking in amounts of information that any other generation, well, it would have been inconceivable. There were lots of people, and there still are in many parts of the world, that have never read a book. But you can get a book on your tablet or your Kindle or whatever you might have and, and download the thing in 30 seconds and, and read it whenever and you know, it, it, we just have so much at our fingertips. And, and so um, it, the bottom line, our minds like rooms, each one is furnished either intentionally or unintentionally. What's the difference? Well, if I'm intentional, I'm deciding what I'm going to put in. If I'm not, I've just got a remote. And, uh, and then, you know, whatever, it's like, okay, sports, and it's mindless, but, you know, it's semi-brutal and fun to watch. And, and uh, but, you know, I know some of you guys are into mixed martial arts, and some of you wives are like, but why do they like it? Why? You know, they're guys. They can't help it. And so... Uh, Here's the, here's the last, and we'll press on. Spiritually, God is a master builder. And you should know that, that he describes us as a temple for himself. He's made us as a place for him to dwell and for him to work so he can dwell in us and work through us. And then corporately, we're described in the same way. So individually, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. God dwelling in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. Corporately, we are a temple unto our God. And so in a very real and, and yet sort of mystical way, when we gather together, we know Jesus is here in a greater dimension. And, and it, it's a reality when we leave, he goes with us because he is within us in the person of the Holy Spirit. But when we gather, it says he inhabits the praises of his people. Not just because he's in us, but because he is with us. Well, there's more, of course. He planned and purposed all this. His blueprint, by the way, for building this temple, my body, into the, the man he wants me to be, this temple, this body, Calvary Chico, the blueprint is the Bible. That's why we're reading it. That's why we're studying. We want to know, okay, Lord, what is it you're wanting to build? And what does it look like? And how do we furnish it in a way that will make you comfortable here? Make you at home with us. The model home, by the way, if we were a housing track, a temple track, if you will, it's his son, Jesus. You ever walk through one of those model houses and you're like, oh my gosh, this place is amazing. If you saw it without all the staging, you just think, hey, it's a house just like mine. But they have all this great stuff in there. That's really what's happening. You see Jesus, you see, well, the model house. You see the model temple. You see what it looks like when God has full access, when the Father has full control, when the Holy Spirit's always at work. When nothing's ingested or, well, nothing is regurgitated, that, 
that's damaging or defiling to others. That's our Lord, our, our Savior, His Son, Jesus. A wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge, verse 5, increases strength. He's reminding us that experience with the Lord and experience in the Word not just reading and believing it, but experiencing the reality of it, it leads to confidence. A wise man stands unafraid in the face of adversity. Why? Because we've learned our strength is in the Lord. If you're just getting started, if you're younger or you're newly married, I know that's the case for some, newlyweds or been married for a few months listen you will go through so many things that test your faith as a couple you go through it individually then you marry now it's a couple and then the two become one you can't go through anything without your 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 husband or if you're a gal your wife if you're a guy you know being a part of all that and every single thing that happens you you realize man the Lord is so faithful. The Lord, he always comes through for us. You know well David cared for sheep and that, well, he had experiences out there caring for the sheep, a wolf, a, a, a lion, you know, whatever might come, a bear. It didn't matter because he learned that the Lord would deliver him from those. Why? Because his focus wasn't on his safety, but the safety of the sheep. And the Lord was always there to watch out for David. And when he stood before Goliath, he had history. Not just, hey, I could take a lion or I could take a bear. No, I, the Lord who delivered me from the mouth of the lion and the bear. You see, it, it, Goliath, as big as he was and bad as he was, he was standing alone. David was standing in the strength of the Lord. That's you. That's us. Verse 6 says, By wise counsel you, were, you will wage your own war. And in the multitude of counselors there is safety. Wisdom, that's a gift from God to all who seek Him and His plan for their lives. Spiritual warfare... Well, we're all engaged in it, so we need spiritual wisdom, spiritual armor, spiritual weapons. We need spiritual power. That's why Paul tells us to, to put on the full armor of God and having done all to stand, stand. Take up the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Take up prayer. And no, that's how the spiritual battles are won. Those are the weapons of our warfare. And so, uh, again, um, this by wise counsel, you'll wage your own war. By wise counsel, a multitude of counselors, their safety, that only works if the multitude of counselors are wise. If you've got a multitude of fools around you, you aren't safer. You're in greater danger. A more, multitude of fools is more dangerous than one fool alone. But so... To the wisdom of the wise. Well, wisdom too lofty for a fool, verse 7. He does not open his mouth in the gate. Now that's a word picture for us. And because, well, you know, we have time tonight. This isn't a very long proverb. And, and it goes some interesting places. The gate is the place in their history where judicial decisions were rendered. They didn't go down to the courthouse and you know, file papers or, you know, they didn't have to go down and get a permit to build. Not in the way we do. They didn't have to go down and get a marriage license or a driver's license. I mean, pretty much if you can ride a donkey, you can ride a donkey. And, you know, you don't need a license for that. But, but he, here's, here's what was happening. People would gather, the elders would gather at the gate of the city. And if you had a legal issue to deal with, you would come to the gate and, and you would say, hey, here's, here's my issue. And they would render a judgment. And, and it was just as if there'd been an actual, well, what we would consider a legal proceeding or a contract sign or such. Now, there's actually a very practical law with a very strange procedure attached back in the book of Deuteronomy. And, and uh, I'm not going to necessarily, well, you know what? Turn back there with me. Why? 
Because we can. I mean, it's an Old Testament study, right? It says that right on the marquee, I think. And so uh, Deuteronomy 25, I want you to see it just because it's so strange. You'll be like, hey, you want to see something strange? You can get people who never read the Bible before to read if you tell them you got some weird stuff for them. And so Deuteronomy 25, oh, picking up at verse 5. Um, this is a law called the marriage duty of the surviving brother. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. Her husband's brother shall go into her, take her as wife, perform the duty of a husband's brother to her, and it shall be that the firstborn son which she bears will succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may be not blotted out in Israel. So see the practicality of this and then a couple quick, you know, warnings if you happen to end up in a culture like this somehow. It's, it's practical because, uh, well, the, the gal married into the family. And, and now land is attached and there's all sorts of other inheritances. And if there's children involved, in this case, there are no children. But there's a need for a child because the name needed to carry on. And, and, and so that's exactly what it's saying will happen. Uh, so your, your brother marries a gal, you better make sure that you like her. You know, he'd be like, he, she's not the one, dude. She is not the one. And if he's not healthy, you definitely want to make sure he, he, she's not the one. Now, if she is the one, great. But uh, anyway, if the man, verse 7, this is where it starts to get weird. If you think that part's weird, it's not. That's the part that makes sense. If the man does not want to take his brother's wife, I could see that happening. Let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders. So here we are, seat of judgment, elders of the city, seeking wisdom, counsel, judgment. And say, my husband's brother refuses to raise up a name to his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. And the elders of the city shall call him and speak to him. And if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her. Then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face, and answer and say, so it shall be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. I told you it was a strange procedure. I get the taking off the shoe. No, I don't. I did some research. Nobody understands this. There are some people who claim to understand it, but I don't know why. But, but spitting in his face? It's not exactly the normal court procedure, unless it's those weird court shows that I never watch. But I once did. It's like a train wreck. You know, you're flipping through trying to find a basketball game and you see it. It's day court or whatever it is. And you're like, oh, my gosh, what is this? I don't want to watch this. These people are insane. But you can't get, you know, you've been there. Anyway, his name shall be called in Israel. Hey, change your name, the house of him who had his sandal removed. And so it sounds more ominous than it really is. Well, listen, we see all this go down. Since we're there, we can move ahead to Ruth. So, so if you're in Deuteronomy, turn right. You go through Joshua, you go through Judges. And, and I think right after Judges, this little teeny book, Ruth, and uh, it's before 1 Samuel, so if you find your way to 1 Samuel, then, you know, you've gone too far. Ruth chapter 4, though, that's where we pick up. Because we see all this go down in the book of Ruth, although it is, they've kind of weeded out the things that were most offensive to us, but they stick with the shoe thing. And so uh, it's the book of Ruth. Boaz wants to redeem, well, he wants to redeem Ruth. He wants her as wife. She's been married. The, the, her husband died. Her sons are died. I mean, it, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. She was gone for a while. She's back home. Boaz takes a liking to her. And, and so uh, anyway, what happens is, is in order to have her as wife, there was this process of redeeming the land because this is all tied to the, the family name and the inheritance and all this. And so in, in Ruth 4.1, Boaz went up to the gate, he sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. Now, this is the story of the kinsman redeemer. Close relative, 
that might be good, but it's not great for a translation of this particular reality. Family Redeemer, that's the New Living Translation. Actually, you know, it's better. But then NIV, the nearly indispensable version, translates it Kinsman Redeemer. I don't know if any of you shop at Sears. They have three qualities of everything. They have good stuff, they have better stuff, and then they have the best stuff. And what I want is the best stuff for the good stuff price. But that's me. And so uh, anyway, here we have it. It's the story of a kinsman redeemer. It's important that we get that because this is closely related to why Jesus even became one of us. It was necessary for him to be able to redeem us. Well, Boaz says, come aside, friends, sit here. He came aside and sat down. He took 10 men, verse 2 of the elders of the city, said, sit down here. They sat down. He said to the close relative, Naomi, who's come back from the country of Moab, sold a piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought to inform you, saying, buy it in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of the people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. If you will not redeem it, then tell me, and I may know, for there is, that, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I'm next after you. Then he said, I'll redeem it. And Boaz said, on the day you buy the field, from the hand of Naomi, you must buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. Now, they all know this law. He's just bringing up the law we considered in Deuteronomy. And so uh, the close relative said, well, I can't redeem it then, lest I ruin my own inheritance. And I don't think his wife would have liked it either, by the way. And so uh, he says, you redeem my right of redemption for yourself. I cannot redeem it. Verse 7, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything. One man took off his sandal, gave it to the other, and this was a confirmation in Israel. So it actually is pretty good. I mean, you get the land and you get a shoe. Um, I think it works better if you work two deals for pretty obvious reasons. But, um, you know, and hopefully he's wearing the, you know, no, he wouldn't be. I'd, I'd say like, hey, what do you want for the other shoe? I, I, that would be my first question. Well, the close relative says to Boaz, buy it for yourself. He takes off his sandal. Boaz said to the elders and the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilon's and Malon's from the hand of Naomi, moreover Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day." Now, here's what's most exciting about this. And you're saying, most exciting? There hasn't been anything exciting. No, it's pretty cool that God would make provision and detail it in such a way that a widow would be cared for, that a widow would be provided for, that, that well, one who had a son and, and, and lost the son, that name could carry on as well. Well, Jesus, you should know, is called in the New Testament, our kinsman redeemer. And he did the very same thing that Boaz does here. By the way, in order to be a kinsman redeemer, these three things were required. You had to be related by blood. See, that's why Boaz said, you're first, I'm next in line. You take it, or, but if you take it, you get Ruth. He goes, I can't have Ruth. You can have the land. But you're buying the land, not because you need land, but because you want the bride. And track with me on this, because no picture is more wonderful as it were late to a, a husband wanting a bride. Well, Jesus, in order to redeem us, well, he had to be one of us. It explains the incarnation when people are like, well, maybe he just appeared as an apparition. It couldn't have worked. If he hadn't been fully human, if he didn't have our blood flowing through his veins, he could not have redeemed us because the kinsman redeemer had to be related by blood. You had to be willing to pay the price. And the price of your redemption and mine, it was his blood shed. It was his life given for us that we might have life. But not just able to pay, you had to be willing to pay. 
And in this case, the motivation was love. And in the Lord's case, the same motivation. He became one of us. He was willing to pay the price. He was able to pay the price because only a sinless man could have redeemed us from the curse of sin that came upon us because a sinless man went ahead and sinned. Adam, first sinner of the male persuasion. Jesus is called the last Adam. Not that he's the last man, but the last and really now only perfect man. Well, there's one more thought, and then we press on. Ruth was loved by Boaz. Boaz was related by blood, willing to redeem, able to redeem. He bought the field so he could have the bride within. And Jesus tells the parable of the one who finds a treasure in a field. And for a love for that treasure, because it's precious to him, he hides the treasure. And then he goes and he buys the field that he might obtain the treasure within it. How does he buy it? With his precious blood buys the field by giving his life. Well, that's the picture that I wanted you to get, and, and that's worth spending time on, right? Let's go back, Proverbs 24, and we'll pick up the pace, not that we're in any hurry. You got anywhere to be? Not me either. Um, we could do 25 too if you want. No, I know you don't. Proverbs 24, he, oh, verse eight, that's where we are. He who plots to do evil will be a schemer called a schemer, the devising of foolishness is sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to men. The, the, the gist of this is the owner of evil plans wastes time, wastes energy, and wastes resources. But the key word is waste, that, that he's wasting his talent, his, his thoughts, his ingenuity, if you will, just scheming to take advantage devising foolishness. If you faint, verse 10, in the day of adversity, your strength is small. We know we're all tempted, we're all tested. We already mentioned we're all to armor up and stand our ground. And like Israel at the edge of the Red Sea, it stands still and see the salvation of the Lord. Most of the crises I found myself in there was no running from them, and there was no overcoming them. I just had to stand and wait and see what the Lord had in mind. And I think that's going to be true for you as well. Deliver, verse 11, those drawn toward death. And there's a word picture there. It's talking about the person not just stumbling blindly into a dangerous situation, but enamored with something, and on the other side, there's death. And it's saying, deliver them. Defend, the word means. Rescue, recover. You see someone going the wrong direction. You know they're blinded to the fact of what they're doing. It said, deliver them. Hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. You see, because all have sinned, all are headed to hell. And the only way to avoid it, come to faith in Jesus. Know and Believe that when he shed his blood, it was sufficient. That when he cried, paid in full, it is finished. It means exactly that. If you say, verse 12, surely we didn't know this. Does he not who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? It's a reminder, and we've seen it from Adam all the way to Revelation. Adam and Eve tried to hide from the Lord. Why? Because they'd sinned against them. David tried to hide his sin. It was just as futile. And he talks about the heartache and the, the pain and the, the anguish and, and the, the, the physical ills he experienced. All because he was trying to cover his sin. And then later he repents and he, and he moves from hiding from God and hiding his sin to hiding in God. Beautiful song. We sang it for decades. You are my hiding place. We might want to revive it at some point. In any case, those who hope to get by by feigning ignorance, well, that's what he's saying here. Well, hey, I didn't know it was going to happen. I didn't see what was going on. Hey, we should heed the Bible's warning. Your sin will find you out. 
And it isn't just about sins of commission. I think as believers in Jesus, especially growing believers, maturing believers, we've got a pretty good handle on not doing this and not doing that and not doing this. Of course, he's saying don't do this and don't do this and don't do this. If we're paying attention at all and obeying, we're going to be succeeding. But the problem isn't always sins of commission, the things we do that we shouldn't have done. It's sins of omission. And that's where, well, it's, a, it's no gray area, but it's an area that seems less clear to some of us. Well, I don't know if I need to do that. Am I supposed to do that? Is that really what God's calling all of us to? So you read things, and, and, and it talks about the guy who Jesus tells, sell everything, give the money to the poor, and follow me. Now, I've shared in the past with you, I don't think he's saying that to everyone. I'm not sure that things would go better if all of us sold everything we have and gave the money to the poor. Of course, we would be joining them. And, uh, and, and so, it, you know, we'd be in the line with them to get our stuff back. But, but here, here is what is going on in that. This guy had a problem with the love of stuff. And Jesus sees the heart and he tells him, you need to sell all. You need to give it all away. You need to come and follow me. And, and, and here's what I want to make sure happens for, for me and, and for my family and for, for you guys. And that is we're not just focused on what we're not supposed to do. But we're focused on, God, are you telling me to do that? There have been people in this body over these 30 years who sold everything and gone on the mission field. And, uh, you know, it's hard to take a lot of stuff with you on, you know, to Africa or to India or some of the places, Pakistan, some of the places people have ended up. But, but the point is there was, there was one person in our body who sold every single thing they owned. And then, instead of putting that money away for the mission work, they gave it to another missionary. And, and, and I'm like, are you sure the Lord's telling you to do that? I wasn't suggesting he wasn't. I was just saying, I'm not, you know, in my natural, you know, reasoning mind, that doesn't seem the most practical. And the response was pretty clear. Hey, if I give it all away and he wants me to go, won't he provide for my every need? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I've been teaching that for 35 years. Uh, I guess I think, you know, this person understood it as good as you can. But again, the, the Bible says specific things to you and requires, God requires that of you. And he doesn't require that of everyone. So if we're like, well, all my friends that are Christians, they still do this. They still watch that or they still drink this or hope not smoke that but anyway that they still are doing and the question isn't can they do that and and be okay with the Lord it's can you do that and be okay with the Lord if he asks you to give it up or he asks you to take it up to do something or to stop doing something well it, 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 we got to do just that and so that's really all I got to say about that verse 13 says my son Eat honey because it is good. If you're freaking out about sugar, eat honey. It's excellent. The honeycomb, which is sweet to your taste, so the knowledge of wisdom will be sweet to your soul. If, I found, if you found it, there's a prospect and your hope will not be cut off. Listen, he's reminding us of a spiritual reality tied to a physical reality. And it's the same way Jesus teaches where Jesus takes what everyone gets, what everyone understands. Sometimes we have to explain it because we're in a different culture and in a different time in history. But when, when he's mentioning honey, it's because it, it restores and, and refreshes physically. And, and there are instances in the Bible, more than one, where somebody was in battle and they were famished and they were weary and they just grabbed some honey and ate it and, and it revived them. But in the same way, an understanding of God's word will restore and refresh us spiritually, providing hope even in the seasons when we're worn and when we're weary. Do not lie in wait, verse 15. He moves from the wise, straight talk to the wicked, I would think this wouldn't be any of you. 
but I always want to think the best. And so if I'm wrong and you're wicked, then he's talking now straight up to you. Do not lie in wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Do not plunder his resting place, for a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. It's a double warning to the wicked that God will always rescue the righteous, but the unrighteous will fall and not rise again. There is something for the righteous here, though, not just assurance that God will be with us and for us, and although I'm grateful and comforted by that. He says, a righteous man may fall seven times. It's not his main thing that he's saying here, but to me, it just speaks volumes. Because it's not saying the righteous man never falls or never stumbles or is never taken down, if you will. He just says, we always get back up. We always rise again. He lifts us up. We find our way. Do not rejoice, verse 17. It gets a little strange here. When your enemy falls. And do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. It's a revelation to some. A reminder to others. That those who know the Lord should be like the Lord. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So... If we're his and we're representing, how could we find pleasure or take joy when our enemies fall, when our enemies die? And here's the thing. Jesus taught us to love our enemies, bless those who curse us, do good to those who hate us, pray for those who spitefully use us and persecute us. But verse 18, it's like, Who sees this coming? He says, don't rejoice when your enemy falls. Don't be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and it displease him and he turn away his wrath from him. I would have never thought of that. That God might actually stop punishing somebody because I'm finding joy in watching them suffer. It just seems so out there. But the reality is, as he's saying, first of all, don't take joy in their suffering. And if you do, watch out, because he's watching us for our own good. And because he's so gracious, hey, the appeal is to one who take pleasure in the judgment of someone he despises, who doesn't share God's heart of mercy. Of course, we all want mercy, at least for us. For others, maybe. But for us, absolutely. So, He's saying God's displeasure might lead him to just stop punishing them. And your delight will come to a quick and speedy end. Jonah comes to mind. He often does for me. I like his story. I learned it as a child. I learned as an adult that, well, I already knew it as a child that that it was all true. You know, I didn't have to to be convinced that a fish could swallow a man or, or that a whale, we don't know if it was a whale or a fish. We do know this. It swallowed Jonah and he lived within it. And then it spewed him out. And, and most of you are familiar. He, God said go and he said no. And God forced the issue and he ends up where he's supposed to be. And he preaches to a people he absolutely hated. I mean, if he had any prayer, he would pray for him. It's like, Lord, crush him, destroy him. He despised them. And listen, they were worthy of it. They were one of the worst, most brutal, most horrific cultures ever. Do some study, some research on the Ninevites. And you'll see why Jonah hated him. And, and then you'll be able to say, okay, well, I can, I can relate. But God loved the Ninevites. And and that's what we need to remember. I was mentioning, you know, the suicide bombers and that. God can never love what any sinner does because God's not going to sin or engage in it or take pleasure in it. But he can still love the person. And if you're like, I don't know that I I could. Hey, what if it were your child? As horrific as that idea is, we need to be able to embrace it because God sees a world of, well, his creation and potential children, people loved by him. 
And so we just see good and bad people. You know what he sees? Bad people. And, and, and it's like the good guys, those are the guys he's changed, he's saved, he's transforming. But none of us were on the good side of the equation until he came into our lives. Well, you know, Jonah didn't want to go preach to the Ninevites because he had a family secret and he wanted to keep it in the family. He didn't want them to know God's long suffering and merciful and gracious, exceedingly so. And when they did what he was afraid they might repent, God did exactly what he knew God would do. He forgave them. And how does Jonah deal with that? He pouts. And he, and he complains. And he's like, I can't believe it. I knew this was going to happen. You know, I, you're so good. You're so merciful. I hate that. You know, it's, it's, it's so crazy. And, and the reason I like him is because I really think we're more like him than we realize. We are more capable of despising people that are no worse than us at heart. Oh, maybe they've done some things we would never do. But if he says our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked, well, B.C., before he gave us a new heart that loves and, and wants to know him and the truth. And Well, if he says deceitful and desperately wicked, is there, are there measures of that? Or, hey, he knows. Well, verse 19, because we got to press on. Got a few more. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the wicked. We already looked at it. Why? Death, destruction is sure. There is no prospect for the evil man. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. My son, fear the Lord and the king. Do not associate with those given to change, for their calamity will rise suddenly, and who knows the ruin these two can bring. Given to change. It sounds familiar. I can't really place it though. Here's what I'm sure of. Millions today mock the idea that there's a God at all. And you know what God calls them? Fools. The fool is said in his heart, there is no God. Multitudes of people believe in God. They, they, they say, well, there has to be something or someone out there, but they really don't know who that something or what that something is. Not as great a fool as the one who says, I know there's no God. These guys are saying, I don't know if there's a God. And then there are those who look at the evidence that God says, hey, you want to know how I deal with sin? Look at the flood. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah. They look at the evidence for the flood and say, I don't see a flood. I don't, I don't see. No, that's not what I see. They look at the evidence for creation and say, I, it could have all just happened. Yeah, and a Learjet could just appear on the runway too, but it's unlikely. And I don't really think given the right amount of time and circumstances that something could blow up and create a Learjet. And I would like to suggest a Learjet is nothing compared to the planet, to the universe, to, to this whole thing. The organization, you already know, you're on the same page with this, but here, here's what, where I'm going with it, is God has judged in the past, and when he says, you know, I'm going to judge again, he points back to say, look at that, because this is how I feel about sin, and this is what I'll do if sin isn't repented. Second Peter 3 says, those who mock the coming of the Lord in judgment willfully forget the flood of Noah's day. And, and God's promise that, hey, I'll never do that again next time. Fire. That's what it says. The Lord's not slack concerning his promise. Here's the hope. But is long suffering, not willing any perish, but all come to repentance. It's not saying none will perish because some won't repent. But he's saying that's not his plan. That's not his will. That's not his desire. These things, verse 23, also belong to the wise. It is not good to show partiality in judgment. This issue of partiality it'll come up in James 2 this weekend as we look at the royal commandment so we'll just press on into these last few verses verse 24 he who says to the wicked you are righteous him the people will curse nations will abhor him those who rebuke the wicked will have delight and a good blessing will come upon them 
Sadly, we live in a day where praising the wicked is more and more common, while accusing the righteous of sin is not only acceptable, but encouraged. God promises to pour out his blessings on the faithful who endure till the end. That's what's happening here. Verse 26 is a little odd. He who gives a right answer kisses the lips. I'd rather just have the answer, thank you very much. But what he's actually saying is a good answer is as good as a kiss. He's saying it's sweet, it's affectionate, it's tender, it's, it's beautiful. Prepare your outside work, verse 27. Make fit for yourself in the field and afterward build your house. This is one of those, those sayings that doesn't make as much sense in our culture. But it helps to know that the forefathers, Solomon's forefathers, David's forefathers, those who came before, they were nomadic. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they dwelt in tents. And your outside work here would be a reference to providing for the needs of your family. Well, the house you build is talking about providing for their comfort. And, and of course, a tent filled with food is better than a palace with none. And that's why he's saying focus on providing what's essential and then worry about the things that will make people more comfortable. Verse 28, do not be a witness against your neighbor without cause. If they call you to the gate of the city and they're like, did this guy do this? Did this guy do this? He's saying, don't stand there and bear witness if it's not true. For would you deceive with your lips? It's a simple reminder, God honors honesty and he judges dishonesty. Do not say, I will do to him just as he's done to me. I will render to the man according to his works. Romans 12, 19 fleshes this command out when Paul writes, Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. In doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The greatest danger for me when people mistreat me or slander or hurt or wound me or someone close to me, the greatest danger is that I will respond in like kind that I'll respond in the flesh, that I'll do what comes natural instead of do what comes only from the Spirit of God in a knowledge of the Word of God to love and bless and care for because it, it, my heart should not be like Jonah's. Your heart should not be like Jonah's. We should be like, Lord, forgive them. Father, forgive them. That's the one we're following. They know not what they do. Verse 30, we conclude with an agricultural illustration, pregnant with practical application. I went by the field of the lazy man and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. And there it was all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an armed man. It's a reminder. We sow what we reap. But if we don't sow it all, there still will be a harvest. It will just be a harvest of weeds. We started with the idea that we plant intentionally in our hearts, in our minds, we do the same in our families. We're doing the same in the fellowship. We're intentional. When we open the word, physically, mentally, morally, spiritually, we're planting for a righteous harvest. And if we don't, well, the weeds will just take over the field. Lord, we thank you for these many words of wisdom. And I pray that my small contribution wouldn't obscure anything you have to say and hopefully would bring clarity where there's, well, been a little fog. I pray, Lord, that we'll get better and better in our 
just reading your word and enjoying it, even the things that try us or are difficult for us, that we would just be drawn in. Now, Lord, Lord, we thank you tonight for that beautiful picture of Boaz buying the field so he could have Ruth, whom he so loved. And to know, Lord, that Solomon, David, others, and the lineage of Boaz and Ruth. And we're so grateful for the even more wonderful picture of Jesus buying the world for the treasure within and to find that we're that treasure, that he became one of us so he could lay down his life for us. He was able to redeem. He was willing to redeem. He was related by blood and he shed that blood for the remission of our sin. We're so grateful tonight. And Lord, we want to pray together in unity. If there'd be even one person here who's outside, they're in the room, but outside looking in spiritually. They're, they're with us, but not really of us because they're still dead in trespasses and sin. You've given us life. You've forgiven our sin. You've begun a transformation that we know you're going to complete. We pray not one here would be lost to you. You sent your son for them. He died for their sin as well. And if you're here and, and somehow you've made it through up to this point in your life without surrendering, to the Lord Jesus without saying Jesus come into my life be my Lord be my Savior forgive my every sin tonight I want to give you that opportunity and I'd ask you just to raise your hand to hold it high to, to say Sam pray for me right now I want to know the Jesus you speak of the Jesus I see in my friends and in my family I want to know the forgiveness that, that I'm hearing is on the table I want it I want him. I want life. Anyone this hour, anyone this evening. Don't get that. Lord, we thank you for every person you've drawn. And we're certain, Lord, that you're doing a good work. Bless the rest of our evening. Bless our fellowship and our conversations. Remind us of those things that you've spoken to our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.